Hello, everybody. All right. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Why don't we open with prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the beginning of this new year and the many blessings you bestow upon us. We pray that your spirit be with us as we begin this adventure of reading through and reflecting on your word for this year. Guide and direct us and all the facilitators who will be leading in this year ahead. And we pray that you will enlighten us and show us new insights to your word and how it can guide and direct who we are as your disciples. So we give you our time together and pray that you will bless us as we strive to be more faithful in our service to you. In Christ's name we pray that God's people say, Amen. 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 Okay. Everybody come on in. Let me try and explain to you what I think I understand to be our adventure this year. Um, you collect a, a handout and a little, little booklet. Uh, the booklet is our assignment for the year. Uh, if you look at the assignment and say every week you're supposed to read what's listed here, um, and the past. So some of these assignments are pretty uh I, that was the last one. I didn't expect as many people. <laughs> uh, problem to have. We are supposed to read oh, look at whatever's listed for that weekend. Um, they are their handouts there, they're available for for you uh, to read that. Now, what are we gonna do on Sunday morning? We are not gonna deal with the entire passage. That is not what we're going to do. Every facilitator is going to pick something about that section and try to focus on it. Like today, we're going to focus on three portions of the first 25 chapters of Genesis. A portion of chapter 12 called Abraham. Chapter 16, where you have the birth of Ishmael. And then the first part of chapter 21, where Isaac comes along, and then all of a sudden there's a problem. You have Ishmael and Isaac, and what are you going to do? And in that uh, the, the convergence of those three chapters, you're going to have what is going to be sort of the beginning of this month. And we'll talk a little bit and reflect on what causes that problem initially. And we're going to see that Ishmael, after chapter 21, disappears. Quran picks it up. But Isaac then goes on. But we're going to see something interesting that's introduced, surrogate motherhood, that's going to be picked up next week. In chapter 30, where you have our good buddy, um, um, Jacob, who has four wives. Two of them are servants. And you go, what? All of this is in the Bible. Next week's fascinating. We're going to talk about civil rivalry, um, which is really going to be interesting. I want, I want you to do with this next week. But for all of you who have siblings, how many of you have siblings? Ah. If you have siblings, I want you to think about this. If you have siblings, did your parents, whether they intended to or not, show any favoritism? Think about that for next week. So basically, the first 25 chapters. Oh, and, and they're not wearing masks. Some of that. We'll ask everybody. But they're just not <laughs> muted. Uh, so basically, what we have is going to deal with portions of it. So we're going to deal with those three chapters. Mm -hmm. And so we'll read portions of that. And, and being a typical preacher, the call of Abraham up on the board is in your first page of the handout. Oh, there we go. We got more? We are, we don't. I didn't expect this big of a crowd. I will have plenty next week. Um, so basically, in the call of Abraham, and you're going to come back to this over and over and over again. The initial call to Abraham 
basically, I get alliteration. The promise of God to Abraham includes three things. And hopefully, this helps to remember. The promise includes property, it includes progeny, offspring, and it includes being famous. Promise. You will be famous. And that's particularly in, in verse 2 of that. And so, without any further ado, this, this chapter um, 12 is an important one. And if you have your scriptures, it really begins with verse 31 in chapter 11. Would someone read, beginning with verse 31 in chapter 11 through 12, 9? Someone read that for me? Sure. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter in law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you, I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions which they had gathered, and the persons that they had gotten in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had prepared to him, who had appeared to him. Thence he removed to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent and Bethel on the west, and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord, and called on the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward Nahed. Okay. Now, you see, that's the initial call and promise to Abraham, or Abram. And particularly in verse 2, note, property, progeny, prominence. Look at the map. On the back of your handouts. That, that's sort of the key thing that gets us all started. In verse 31, he comes to Hera down in Or, way down on the bottom of the map. See that? They journey. Now, these are nomads, they're, they're herders. And so they journey all the way up to Haran, and they hang out there for a while. And then, basically, God comes to... Can I have $4.99? It's coming off the computer. Okay. Yeah. 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 They weren't out here. Yeah. 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 He gets the call, the promise, and then he heads down a note into Canaan is one problem. What's the problem? They don't know it. There it's occupied. There are people living there. And he decides, I'm not going to cause any problems at this point. And so he heads further south. And you see Bethel and I. And he sort of hangs out or builds a, um, uh, an, an altar there and heads a little further south to Beersheba. And that's a key area. You're going to come back to that in a little while, where you see um, Hagar is going to flee down that area when she has to get out of town because of Sarah. So, note, catch, he's, he's, he's on the move. And Heron is going to be important next week when you read that uh, 
Jacob's got to get out of town. Where's he going to go? Back to Haran because he's got cousins up there. Um, and so keep this map handy because it's going to give you sort of the lay of the land about where people end up going and fleeing. And you're going to see, if you were to read on, when there is a famine, where does Abram go? Where do they always go when there's a famine? Egypt. Egypt. They're always heading to Egypt. Egypt is a key area. They head down to Egypt. They don't come back, but they always head down to Egypt. That's going to be key next week, too, heading down to Egypt when there's a drought or a famine. So keep these things in mind because there's a theme that comes back over and over and over again as you see that. But key map, as you, you see the, the, the cities on here, where it ends up on the journeys. So, Abram. Some people call this promise covenant. Now, you read this, and you read the situation and the the ages and that kind of stuff. What is your first impression when you read Abram's situation in life? Any any reaction to just getting your first impression about where Sarai and Abram are in life? Looks like they're kind of stuck, perhaps. She's very old. They have no kids. Say that again, Martin, a little louder. They have no children. Yeah. You know, I just celebrated my 71st birthday, and I look down here, and I see his age, and I go, what? <laughs> what? I mean, oh, they're asking, <laughs> traveling up. And he says, oh, you ain't finished yet, buddy. I mean, it's like, what? You know, and you look at that, and no children. Now, look at the promise. I'm going to make you what? A great nation. Yeah. What's the problem with that? Yeah. How you do it without kids? Yeah, heirs. A bit of a problem there. Uh, yeah, I, and you really have to sort of sit back and kind of scratch your head and say, okay. And and all of this is 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 sort of interesting to keep the tension in mind here, because this is this is a promise and a covenant now. When you think of covenant and promise, you usually think of it in what terms? Contract is a contract. Yeah, contractual. And when you have a contract, you usually think of fulfilling it, binding. Yeah, binding, and you usually have two two parties, right? Oh, uh, you do this, I'll do that. Now, what's interesting here. And, and page two gets into sort of the, the commentary on this thing. Um, at first sight, does God expect too much from Abraham? Are there any laws that he has to keep? He just says go. He just says go. Now, it's, it's sort of interesting as commentators look at this, at first sight, I don't expect too much out of this guy. Just says, go. Second thing is, he's in a polytheistic culture. And, and the gods in the polytheistic culture are concrete. Trees, this kind of thing. Um, blocks that they worship. What's different about this? Invisible. Yeah. It's, it's not physical. It's not physical. I mean, and and it is the everybody assumes that Abram thinks and acts as though it comes from the divine, and that is very unusual for his time. He's a visionary in terms of responding what he feels or thinks is a voice from God that is not. Something that you could touch, see, and very, very different as you see that. Now, it's interesting as you look at how that's interpreted, 
as you look on page two, um, in terms of how Abram is seen as, why did God choose Abram? Number two, he becomes sort of God's proxy on earth. He is chosen not for his sake, for the sake of the world. You know, we've, God's tried several times since the fall to start over again. How has it worked? Not. I mean, it hasn't. I mean, uh, started over with the flood. How did that work? Not. And as you read through, you, you look at the different times that the restarts. Not. So you have basically a restart again. And, and note when the commentator says a summons of the world to devote itself to God. And basically, the, the contract is do this today and you'll be blessed tomorrow. Now, catch how Islam stresses Abram's response. What does he do? And the key word here is going to be used in the next passage. He submits. submits. Do not miss that response. He submits or surrenders to God. Now, I always find this interesting to reflect on. How are we Christians in surrendering or submitting? How do we do with that? Why is God? Not well. <laughs> you know, and, and if you have uh, real devout Muslim friends, that's a big deal. Submission, surrender. And not ones who have been Americanized. I find once once people come to American soil, they get broken. I mean, I mean, it is just all over. But if you, they're serious and, and devout in their, in their commitments to Islam, submission, surrender is a big deal. I mean, big deal. And you know, with, with Christians, we're constantly trying to negotiate with God. Can't we? And I, 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 that's the one thing that has struck me about the, the two different traditions is that submit, surrender, and that's particularly how you look at the interpretation of Abram's response to God's voice and how Islam has understood that. Note the second paragraph on three. The Quran suggests that in recognition of these traits, God chose Abram to make him a leader of a great nation. And note Surah. The word Surah means chapter in the Quran. There are 114 chapters in the Quran. And in chapter two, it says, when the Lord put Abram to the proof by enjoining him to uh, certain commandments, and Abram fulfilled them, he said, I have appointed you, this is Allah, appointed you a leader of mankind. The text says at this moment made a covenant and considers it the start of a nation of Muslims that reached fruition in multiplying. So as you look at that, Abram's response sets the standard for Muslims in how you deal with God. Quran start off uh, telling the story, story is, is like is it, you start with Genesis. Did they start with Abraham. Um, actually, that's a good question. I go back and can't remember how it starts in terms of what's the first thing. It does not start that way. Um, but I, I don't know what the exact first story is about. Um, but it's all about stories. Is each story a story? Part of is each story a story a, a story? Is there lessons? Or yes. Lessons yeah. And, and it gives you, um, and it talks about, uh, and it, it talks about how Allah and basically the, the whole tradition has unfolded. And it's amazing. It talks a lot about Jesus in the Quran. It's amazing. Jesus is mentioned over 90 times in the Quran. As a matter of fact, mentioned more than Ishmael. It's fascinating how it talks about Jesus in, in the Quran. Uh, it, it's um, 
almost the, the people realize that it's just now he's not the son of God. Don't get me wrong, but they really talk about who he is and what he represents. So it, it's um, has a lot of uh, similarities in terms of how you live life. And again, submission. And he is a, a model of submission. Uh, once he submits and surrenders and lives an uh, ideal life. And it's a uh, model of God. And note what uh, Sheik Raif says that considering Abraham's covenant to God to be um, not so much a personal one, but the idea that Abraham ensures that belief in one God will not die with him. And note how we should view Abraham and how we should live an Abrahamic life is the key. And Abraham sets the model for how one lives in Abraham, uh, a life in basically a consciousness in, in relating to God. So that, that first call is an important one. Now, Abraham does not come off well in the next two stories at all. So let's, that's the first call. And we get him understanding that he relates to God because he submits and does what God wants him to do. Let's now get muddy in the water. We know that Abram and Sarai are old. Time passes. Let's turn to chapter 16. <clears throat> and it's, it's an interesting thing now. Time has moved on. We still have no child from Sarai. If you're in her spot, now, on page four, remember there are, if you have a handout, there are a couple of uh, typos. The computer did not cooperate with me. Um, down in that last paragraph where it says Sarah afflicts Hagar. Note um, where it says um, as the pharaohs in Egypt and Hagar responds the same way, not say. It shouldn't be say, it should be way. And next to the last line, it's not, not with the word submit, but note and O-T-E with the word submit. Those are the two typos that are there. Would someone read the uh, 16 verses, read the drama that thickens with chapter 16. Okay. I can read it. Okay. Just uh, all of chapter 16 or what verses? All, the whole chapter. Okay. <clears throat> now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. She went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. But Abram said to Sarah, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. And Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord <coughs> said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man, with his hands against everyone, and everyone's hands against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. 
So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are Elroy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. The plot. So, <coughs> to move along, there is still no son by Sarah. Now, <coughs> she then basically calls on a custom that was widely <coughs> done in the Middle East. Surrogate motherhood. Now, done all the time today. You have a surrogate comes in for a child's couple of days, somebody has a child for them. Well, that ain't new. It has been done back in the ancient times. Now, what's interesting here, and note in verse 2, there it says, slave girl, and catch the text. It may be that Sarah says, Sarai, I, not her, I shall have obtained children by her. So it's, it's a Sarah situation. Now, what's your reaction? Any reaction to Sarah's plan here? We don't have a bloodline, but it's true. What's that? Bloodline. Yeah, uh, and you will have continuation of Abraham's bloodline. Now, we don't have we don't have this rule yet. The rule about you're Jewish if your mother's Jewish. That does not does, does not exist yet. That doesn't come until you get the laws of the Torah. That doesn't come until after Moses. That's not in existence yet. They're just wanting an heir. And that comes from Abraham. Any other reactions? No, we knew that was going to go wrong. Any woman who says, go sleep with my husband is mine, that that's not going to go wrong. Open marriage, <laughs> etc. Yeah, it always goes wrong. That's my opinion. I'm sleeping here. <laughs> <laughs> and can you almost... Imagine the inevitability of what unfolds here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. And the other thing is, Abram and Jack, like, you know, I want to say, men are men are men are men, and they have never changed. <laughs> My short take of the whole mess is Abraham should have just said no. I we won't go any further <laughs> than that, other than that. You never, ever give a man an opportunity, permission, if you would. Here's a young woman. Go to it. I mean, cut me a break. Really? Now, I want you to remember this. Next week, he's calling Jacob. Jacob has four, two that are legitimately his wives and two who are surrogates. For in Islam, you are allowed to have four wives, as long as you treat each one of them equally. I want you to think about that for a second. Yeah. <laughs> How in the world do you treat four wives all Where's the, where's the number four come from? Well, Jacob has four. One of them is his favorite. I'll let you figure out which one as you prepare and read the second half. But he does have a favorite one. And it, it's sort of interesting as you look, where do you get number four from? Well, Jacob has four, really. He has children by four women. And the surrogate part is introduced right here. Now, I thought it was interesting. Remember five or six years ago, Roman Downey did that thing about the Bible on, on, on TV the whole way through. You know what part she left out? 
chapters 25 50. I don't know why, but it didn't fit into her neat category about how one lives, one wife, one husband. It didn't fit the soap opera. Wait till we get to next week. I mean, it, it just didn't fit. There's no way you could make that fit. They just left it out. I wanted to say, I'm not watching this. <laughs> You're not dealing with human reality. I mean, next week is really sort of dicey stuff. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. So you have this, and, and notice you get into this. How does Abraham come on? No. Does he stand up and really say, hey, wait a minute here. This, this is just not right. Does he say any of that? No, he made a pushover. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, and you have to think about how he was with the king of or the pharaoh and the adolite too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like cut me a break. So you look at this. He said, "All right," and then you look at Sarai. What has she done? Remember the, the promise over here back in the original call was, "Look, I'm going to give you land." And for a nomad, that's an important deal. I'm going to make you a great nation, which means somehow, sometime, for Abram and Sarai, you're going to have kids. I don't care how old you are, you're going to have kids. And the other part of this story I relate to, my wife and I didn't have our child until we were in our 40s. And it wasn't by any artificial insemination. It, it was surprise, surprise, surprise. I mean, so I can relate to this more than you can realize. Um, she's about to be married in a couple of weeks, and we're in our 70s. And it's just like, this is, this is um, not what I can relate to real easily. But it's like, she is here. Is she trusting God's promise? So the question I raised in the notes is, is she desperate? Has she lost her faith? What is she doing in her relationship to the promise of God? Being pragmatic. I mean, they obviously didn't invent surrogateism. It's out there. And so she said, well, you just watch what to do. I'm still married. And so here, I'm going to try. So yes, she took all. action. And well, maybe why she thought that was as godlike no, no. as any other action. Yeah, basically. Look at verse 2 again. She says to Abram, you see that the Lord has prevented me from having children. <laughs> so when she says that, what is she saying about the original promise? We really believe it. Yeah, God's it. welched on his word. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, what is, is that? Because she... On his word. Now, and in going with the surrogate deal, she is saying, well, that will then be my child. My child. And you go, what does that say about the personhood of Hagar? Sounds like a lifestyle. Yeah. Like an she was a slave. It, it just, this counts. Her personhood. Altogether. 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 She's just a slave girl. She does not count. Mm. Mm. And what's interesting, how the world turns immediately. You know, it's interesting the human interaction here. Immediately when she becomes pregnant, what does Hagar? He just got Sarah. Yeah. She moves. Yeah. Yeah. It's an old switch. Yeah. It's like <laughs> what you couldn't give him. Now, what does that do? Whoa. <laughs> now, just, I, it, 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 it just have to imagine this. Now, and you, you really see the, the tension it builds here. In terms of the household, can can that kind of tension 
you may take. So, not okay. today. Well, not only not today, but not then either. Any day. And and who is really the mistress of the household? Sarah. Sarah. She's slave girl. But she's carrying what? The heir. <clears throat> number one son. We'll get back to that in a second. He's number one son will always be number one son. Now you you you're sort of catching where we're going on this. Number one son. Now the tension got so great. What does Hagar end up doing? Running for it. He's got to get out of town. She runs. Now, interesting, she runs, where does she go? South to sure, down in Beersheba, get your map, down in, in the area of Beersheba. And the scholars look at that, they say, really, that's the same area that the Jews went to initially when they left Egypt. Uh, after captivity, down in that same area. And so she goes down in that area, and she is beside herself because she's running for her, what she sees as her life. She feels threatened. Now, this encounter, and I hadn't realized this, this encounter, who comes to her? An angel. She says, an angel of the Lord. But she interprets that as really an encounter of who's speaking with God. God is speaking with her. Now, I didn't realize this, but does God speak directly to any other woman in the Bible? Abraham. This to Abraham. But is this to any woman? Yes. Oh, very. Well, that's the name. No, this is an angel, too. Describe it. So, I mean. Mm -hmm. So, interesting. By the fact that Hagar encounters God in this way, it elevates her to the level of paper. And she is the only one, only one, as you look down to. <clears throat> Verse 13, <clears throat> who calls God by name. The only person in the entire Bible who does that. Person. And no, calls him by name and still stays alive after encountering him personally. That's all. Most of the belief was you encounter God personally, speak to him, and you. <laughs> God. So this is not only reaching out to her, but encountering her in a, in a way that is transformative for her. And note, back up, as I say, note verses 9 and 10. That word again, sometimes we just skip right over it, but for Muslims it's critical. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and one. Submit. Submit. You want to circle that. Submit. And in your submission, you will be what? Blessed. You will be blessed. blessed. And from your offspring, I will do what? She's a form of great nation. She's, she's actually getting recovered. A form of great nation. You know, it, it's sort of interesting to look. The promise comes not only through Sarah, so you look at that, you go, oh. So you go, oh, this is sort of interesting. She is not to be cast off, and number one son is going to be in the ball game here somehow. Now. 
really interesting. As uh, the angel of the Lord says to her in verses 11 and 12, this has been sort of a fascinating how you understand Arabs. Very complicated. <laughs> um, the whole idea, he will be um, wild ass of a man. Uh, no, that's how Bedouin tribes have been understood. They're out there, and there was a, a wild animals that sort of went in big herds out there. That's sort of how you describe that. that. So it's not as pejorative as it might seem. The latter part, though, he shall be at odds with all of his kin. That probably does describe how the relationship of the tribes in the Arab, uh, so the nomadic Arab uh, countries are going to be in the future. But the first part really describes how the Bedouins uh, were out there in terms of the animals that went in herds out there or what they were described as. So as you go down and you look at this, you really have a unique encounter of Hagar with the God that is unique not only from people, but with women in particular. So you have number one son born, Ishmael, one whom God has heard, name of his name, and goes back and is going to be blessed by her submission to Sarah. So you go, okay, has this been resolved? Let's turn to chapter 21 to see how this thing ends. Now, we have 21 verses. We need to finish off these 21 verses to see how it all is resolved. Can someone read these 21 verses? Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out mm. this slave woman and her son. For the son is lost in the Keep going. So she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on the of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever, whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall be your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of your son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. 
And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Uplift the boy and behold him, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave it the boy to drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the boat. He lived in the wilderness of Quran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Now look at your map. <coughs> Down in Beersheba is where she went. And, and basically that's where God came and delivered her. In the Quran, where basically she goes is not for Sheba, but down in Arabia to current day Mecca. So you have a transformation in terms of where, boom, she goes in the wilderness. So it's the same story, different place. So um, just when you when you think about the two traditions. They are changed in terms of location. And the Hajj, which is the great, basically, the, the journey you make as a, a Muslim, one of the things you do on the Hajj is that you not only go around the Kaaba, but you go outside and you go seven times between the two hills, two blocks, and you drink from the well of Zamzam, which is supposedly the well from which Hagar drew the water to give to Ishmael to survive. Now, that, that is taking this story from Beersheba in Genesis, putting it down in Arabia. So you go, oh, okay. Now, same incident in terms of the, you have the competition. So you begin chapter 21. All of a sudden, you have Sarah pregnant. And you know, Isaac translated means laughing. laughing. Ah, 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 ah. And it's like, and she's embarrassed. The people are going to laugh. Then you have a son at your age? Ah, 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 ah. You know, again, I remember when our daughter was six weeks old. We went up to the farmer's market in Asheville, and she was on my shoulder. And there was this sweet gentleman who, this was a Sunday afternoon after church, he came up to me and said, oh, how lovely your granddaughter is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I looked at him, and he was a typical, nice southern gentleman, and I said, sir, I <laughs> That's my daughter. And he just like he just turned all shades of red. I said, eh, that's okay. That is fine. That works out well. But I appreciate the idea of that. I mean, what that's about. But she is embarrassed. But the key then becomes note her words. Why does she send Hagar and Ishmael away? There. That kid is not going to inherit the farm. <laughs> inherit the farm. Yeah. Now, my question to you is on the first page, now at the bottom, you got to answer the question. And this is, this is the key question. Who is the son of promise? Is it, is it Isaac or is it Ishmael? Remember, the first son gets two-thirds of the goods, 
and the birthright. Second son or anybody who comes after, they split a third and go your way. Now, who is the child of promise? Israel. Isaac. Isaac. Yeah, Isaac. No, and that 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 is the big issue here. How you answer that question? It, it, it's, it's a key thing. Esau and Jacob got to answer that next week when you read the last next twenty five chapters. Um, it's a big deal. It is a big deal here. Now, catch the conclusion on page seven as you look about how this thing is resolved. And I don't know if it's resolved, but where do we come down on this thing is with the call of God. Number one son seems not to get the inheritance, but is he cut out? No. No, he is not. Because it is reiterated several times, he will become what? A great nation. A great nation. Now, this is in the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible. The promise is reiterated over and over and over to Ishmael. Does he get the land? No. Does he get the inheritance? The birthright? No. But is he blessed? Yes. Yes. Now, so you, you look, and, and the tension is there. They share the same values and understanding of who God is. It's called Allah, one Yahweh. But it's, it's understood that God is God, one God. And you know, it evolves over time. But catch. As is apparent, the beginning with the call, God of the Bible is interested in creating a great nation. You get that. You go back to, and you'll see that Nicole, one of the readings today, is the beginning of, of Exodus 17, Genesis 17. That's an elaboration of that. I thought, well, this is good. I'm glad she did that. Um, you read Genesis 17, that's one of the, the scripture readings today, it's an elaboration of the promise. Uh, you can go back and look at the first three verses of chapter 12, Genesis 17, it's the same promise elaborated for eight verses. I mean, it's a key deal, it's over and over and over again, that covenant with Abraham's key. It also applies to Ishmael, as you look at that. So, interesting, on a specific piece of land, beginning with Abraham, Isaac is definitely an inheritor of that tradition. He's the winner of the struggle, so to speak. Ishmael is the displaced rival. However, either therefore or however the Bible is. Because it says, ah, wait a minute, there's always a little caveat here. Ishmael is personally salvaged by God, fathers a dozen princes, becomes a leader of a great nation. Crystalline moral here is that while well, God land may go to one of Abraham's sons, God's blessing goes to um, Lee Barks has a question. Yes, fire away. Well, I think um, I might have sort of figured it out in my own humble little manner, but um, I guess I got stuck on the fact that that God told Abraham, "I'm going to make you, you know, your descendants as many as the stars that you see in the heavens that I'm showing to you." And then, and then, you know, a decade goes by, and so Sarah was faithful for a decade. I mean, they both laughed at the outset. 
but um, I guess it, you know, it bothered me a little bit. And then I, then I realized, well, you know, Sarah got tired of waiting and took matters into her own hands, and maybe that was her downfall. Um, this is just an enormous display of human behavior. So, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, she got to have this trouble with Hagar and the whole thing because she was unfaithful in the end. I'm, I'm still a little bit stuck on the fact that God, you know, the, the, the creator of time, you know, who probably thought that time was indefinite and forever, you know, made them wait for a whole decade. It's like time is going by. How is this going to happen? So anyway, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe she brought that on herself by not waiting and ceasing to faith. But a decade is a long time to wait. <laughs> Particularly when you're that age. <laughs> Got it. So comments or questions uh, in terms of catching the, the tension. Now, the two, two grow out of tension, but they grow out of a common promise that God makes. And, and it's one of the things always trying to keep that in the forefront. They are so closely related in terms of where they come from. It is, is so important. And that idea of, okay, who is the legitimate heir? Yeah, the covenant with Abraham, it doesn't say Abraham and Sarah. I will make them Abraham and Sarah, the great nation of Abraham. And it says a multitude of nations, chapter 17. It's... It's 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 a it's a continual interesting debate uh, that continues. So um, again, in in our ongoing study this year, as you read this week, first 25 chapters, it's it's something to keep in mind as you as you look at that, and you know the thread's going to be throughout all, and that's not all that's in the first 25 chapters, um, but that's just a focal point. And uh, the call of Abraham is absolutely critical as you look at the development of the, the thread throughout the biblical narrative as history unfolds. Next week, it's really going to be interesting. Um, sibling arrival. And you have um, the Isaac cycle, which is very short, but then you have the Jacob cycle, which is really fascinating. And just think so far. <laughs> Make soap opera, seriously. Make soap opera. And, and if you think soap opera and then read start chapter 26 and then read through, read through the rest of Genesis, you'll get it. How many of you have seen Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream? That's the story of Joseph and the yeah. And it's a very accurate rendering. Of a sword, right? uh -huh. and, it's, and it's a fun it's a fun rendering if you've never seen it or heard the musical and you can find it listen to it uh, it's just fun it's a fun fun rendering so um, next week again all of you who've had siblings I want you to think of the issue <laughs> did your parents have a faith and were you it <laughs> And we'll deal with that. We'll deal, we'll, we'll deal with that next week. Um, Bob, would you close the prayer? I certainly will. Thank you, Lord, for the stories that are recorded in the book of Genesis and its importance and guidance for faith uh, families like the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians and help us to uh, be open to the movement of your spirit as we read these passages, and for many of us, see them in a new light. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, John. See you all next week. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John.